All right, everyone, let's get started. Thanks for coming out to ELG. This week we have Liren Chang from Team Security, and he is going to be teaching us how to avoid touching that vermin that sits on all of our desks, the mouse. Um, just my own personal story with one of the things he's gonna talk about, he's gonna talk about TMUX. Um, Vim, I'm an Emacs person, but I'd love to know a little bit about why Vim is so great for some people. But TMUX, like I didn't use TMUX um, until I joined Yelp and my mentor on my very first day saw me with multiple like terminal windows and kind of using the mouse to switch between them. And he really pushed me hard to adopt TMUX and I'm glad he did because I use it at home and I definitely have drunk the Kool-Aid on that. So without further ado, please welcome Liren. Hey guys, so today I'm gonna to give you a talk on some various tools we have on the screen. Um, a bit of background, all throughout college, I've always been okay at programming. Like a lot of my peers, I've been totally amazed by how innovative they were in solving like super complicated problems. Meanwhile, I've been like kind of mediocre. But one thing I did get pretty good at was optimizing the actual process of coding. So instead of optimizing the code itself, I actually spent a lot of time optimizing the keystrokes needed to write my code, which had its pros and cons. But it was actually through this that my obsession and understanding of programming kind of peaked. And that brings me to the title of today's talk, which is going mouseless with Vim, Tmux, and hotkeys. And specifically, the main theme is gonna be how to increase your workflow efficiency. So just a brief overview of what you can expect to learn from this talk. The main thing we're gonna be talking about is using Vim as a lightweight IDE. Now, if I remember correctly, Kyle Anderson gave a survey a while back and it said that 70% of people at Yelp actually use Vim, which is a lot more than I would have thought. And 50% of them use their own customized plugins with 20% of them having their own Vim configuration files. So why Vim? And I'm gonna talk about this in the next slide, but we're gonna really focus on using it as a lightweight IDE. A lot of people don't think this is possible, but I'm gonna show you, you can actually do a lot more than you think. And to show all this stuff, I'm gonna go through some demos so you can actually learn interactively instead of just reading what some bindings do. Then, if we have time at the end, we're gonna talk about persistent, persistent session management using Tmux, or just various screen multiplexers, and how you can use this to delineate different projects you're working on. After that, we're gonna to briefly touch upon hotkeys and how you can pretty make, much make your whole computer act as a Vim editor itself. Which brings me to the last topic, which is getting rid of your mouse. Now, if you're a designer, for example, this probably won't be the best idea, but you will actually learn by developing a keyboard-centric model of programming, it can actually really speed up how fast you edit. So, what is Vim and why use it? So, these are four core features of Vim that I would advocate for its use of. And the first one is its ubiquity. Because it's shipped on almost any Unix-like platform, you can be sure that whatever server you're working on will have some flavor of Vim built into it. Next, it's highly customizable. And this is one of the reasons I was actually so intrigued by Vim in the first place. Whether it be some complicated task, like writing a huge macro that did something very specific to my file, or like doing a binding which like copied some output from another machine. Like you could be sure Vim could do all this for you in one freaking keystroke. Also, it's lightning fast. Super low CPU usage and memory consumption, especially compared to most full-blown IDEs. And finally, the focus of today's talk is that it's super efficient if you speak the Vim language. So there's a joke a lot of people say is, it's great for generating random strings if you can find some new student who doesn't know any Vim and ask them to quit. But we're gonna focus mainly on the last point, how to make Vim super efficient to your needs. So first, what distinguishes Vim from other editors? Well, I wanna highlight here that 
It's because it's a modal editor that it's so efficient. Unlike most other editors, for example, like text edit, you only have one mode of doing whatever you're doing, which is insertion mode. You're just constantly typing and streaming text into a buffer. Now, for writing, this is great. However, as programmers, what we care most about isn't constant flow of writing text. What we care about is editing. And I think the best analogy here is you can imagine programmers kind of being like painters. And painters don't spend most of their time just like continuously doing one brush stroke. No, they prepare their canvas, they like mix up their colors, and then they do individual discrete strokes just like a painter does. So Vim achieves this through four essential modes. There's actually seven, but we're just going to talk about these because they're most important and easiest to understand. So first is normal mode. This is where you do most of your textual visual interaction. Here, you interact with text and tell it what to do. Then you have insertion mode. And also, I highlight how you can get to these modes using different keystrokes. But again, you don't have to memorize any of this. This is just to give you a brief overview of its capabilities. But anyway, in insertion mode, you can insert using I, append using A, and C for a change. So the mnemonics make it super easy to remember. Then you have visual mode. This is just like normal mode, except it works with highlighted blocks of text. And you have different types. You have visual character mode, visual line mode, and visual block mode. And we'll see later how these differ. Finally, you have command line mode. And this is how you utilize those traditional X commands shipped with Unix since like the 90s. For example, doing search and replace or something. So <clears throat> I think one of the best ways to learn is to start off by showing you how not to use Vim. So I'm going to show you how a beginner might approach editing a file from A to B. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> sorry, in this directory we have two files, one.py and one r.py. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open both of these files and I'm going to use the dash u option to mean I'm not going to load any configurations or plugins whatsoever. This is completely just raw Vim we're working with. And I'm going to use the dash o command to mean that I want to split it into two windows. So in this example, what we want to do is we want to transform the text file into the left into the text file on the right. You can imagine the text file on the right being what you want the file to be in your head. And I'm just going to add some very basic settings just to make it prettier so you guys can see it more clearly. And also, to clearly emphasize what changes we want to do, I can actually say for every window to do a diff on it. So anyway, we're on the left window, and we want to change it to the right window. This is how a beginner or amateur Vim user might do it. They might realize that you have a keys like J and K to go up and down, or L and H to go down and uh, left and right. So they might do something like this, go all the way down, go all the way to the right, delete these characters, add it. Oops, I made a mistake. Go all the way down, delete these characters, because all I know is X and HJKL, add the has been. Go all the way down. My fingers are getting super tired. I already hate my life by this point. Add Yelp. OK, add the quotation marks. OK, how am I going to delete this whole method if I just know X for deleting a character? OK, I learned DD. That's pretty helpful. But still, this is like super tedious. Then go all the way to the right and add that self word. And we're done. But by this point in time, you probably think, I hate Vim. I'm never going to use it again. That was way too troublesome. So. Now I'm going to talk about what went wrong. So <clears throat> if there's one thing you remember from this talk, it's that quoting from a classical Stack Overflow flow post that I'm sure a lot of you have seen, your problem with Vim is that you don't grok V. Vim isn't just a character-wise editor. It's a language of itself. And you want to remember these three terms. If there's anything you remember in this presentation, it's these three terms. You want to think in terms of operators, text objects, and motions. And we're going to cover each of these briefly. So operators act upon text objects or motions. So what's an operator? These are the verbs of the Vim language. They specify actions to perform on either your text objects or your motions. And a lot of them are easy to remember. You have C to change, D to delete, and Y to yank in a register or copy into your register. Then you also have some more obscure commands. 
But these also prove extremely useful once you actually build it up into your tool case. For example, G capital U means make uppercase. I like to remember this as go uppercase. Next we have text objects. These are the actual vis visual discernible text objects on your screen. And again, really easy to remember. You have AW for a word, AP for a paragraph, and stuff like IT for inside tag block, or AT for a tag block. So one thing you might be wondering is, what's the difference between A and I? Well, let's start with the tag blocks. That's easy. If you have an inner tag block, that represents the string inside your HTML tag block, for example. OK, what about stuff like A word and inner word, though? Again, it's a similar difference. Inner word represents just the word you're working with, whereas A word represents the word and the space that follows it. So usually, if you're working with a sentence, you can do something like DAW to delete a word, which will make sure that there's no extra white space remaining in your sentence. And finally, another important difference is W versus capital W. Again, capital W just means any stream of non-white space characters, whereas W is what the Vim uh, represents as keywords specifically, which differs based on your settings. So OK, finally, we have motions. Now remember, operators either act upon text objects or motions. But motions can just be motions by themselves. For example, you can do something like 3J to go down three lines. So again, here we have a bunch of different obscure commands, but some of them you all know, like HJKL, left down, upper right. You also have, you also have really nice stuff like F for find, or T for till. And I also like highlight with these lightning bolts throughout my slides, obscure commands that I really think, if you remember, will completely change your workflow altogether. This goes to the beginning of the next method, which, especially for most Python programming um, stuff, it's like super useful. Finally, we have W. Now you might ask, what's the difference between this W and like the W from before? Well, these represent word-wise motions, not the text objects themselves. So whenever your cursor is at a particular position, you can hit W to go word-wise to the right, or go backward using B word-wise to the left. Again, these mnemonics make it really easy to remember. So that was all a bit of a mouthful, and I kind of went over it really quickly. So I'm going to put all of it together. And again, those three things you want to remember, and these can be expressed using this line right here. You have operators acting upon text objects or motions. Or you can just have the motion itself. So for example, 6 plus. This will go down six times to the line Stark. Remember that G capital U command I told you about? This will capitalize a word using go uppercase a word. 3 CE, three times change to word end. Again, all of these although it might look obscure in the beginning, can actually be remembered using these mnemonics. So let's go back to that example we had before. And let's try to edit this by speaking the Vim language instead. And to help you guys interact as I do this, I'm going to post the actual commands at the bottom. So if we start at the beginning of this file, look at that first command, 6 plus. Go to the line six times. Guess what that does? It goes to the line six times. We're there. How do we get to see you on Yelp? Well, we can just use the capital W wordwise uh, word motion. Do it two times. We're there. Make this whole word capitalize. Go uppercase a word. Done. Now, we want to go down three times. Well, I set relative line numbering on here, so it's easy to go using the J, H, K, and L commands. Just do 3J. Go to the next word, W. Change to the end three times. You're done has been added. What's that dollar sign do? It goes to the end of a line. We want to go do that four times, right? Including this current line. Do that. Add it. Add Yelp. You're done. How do we get to the next, me next method? Remember that obscure right um, square bracket M method I told you about? It goes right to that method. And we want to go delete to the next method, just delete to the next method. Done. Percentage sign, we're in there parentheses, and we add self. And that's it. We're done. That was pretty fast, right? So that just highlighted the very core of speaking the language itself. Now I want to talk more about actual advanced navigation. This is like flying at warp speed. 
So Vim has a ton of tools in its tool set. So it's really hard to compress all of this into a one hour presentation. But I tried doing this by differentiating between six core topics. First, we have various motions. And this mainly emphasizes scrolling and using the screen to go to where you want instead of using HJKL all the time. Next, we have editing. Then we have searches, which I hope most of you guys are pretty familiar with. And then marks, the bookmarks of Vim. And then I want to highlight tags. If there's one reason people think Vim sucks as an IDE, it's because they can't jump to the definition of certain keywords. Well, that's where tags come along. And then finally, this last thing, the jump list or change list. This will be the most, oh my god, I wish I knew this. Why didn't I know this a long time ago? I'm going to stick to Vim forever. <clears throat> so first, let's go over various motions. Always be scrolling. You don't need to use HJKL to navigate everywhere. In fact, that's a really bad habit, and I recommend you only do that for jumping to relative lines that are close to your current line. In terms of navigating the screen, again, Vim provides super useful mnemonics. Guess what H, M, and L stand for? The high, middle, and low of the screen. There's also this useful thing called Z, T, Z, 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 B, which I also delineated with the lightning bolt. Instead of going to the high, middle, low of the screen, this moves the screen such that your cursor is at the high, middle, low of the screen. And again, I'll show all you all this cool stuff later. Then we have useful stuff like control up or control down to go up and down half a screen, or control B or control F to go a full screen wise up or down. Then we have editing. Again, I'm not too sure how familiar you guys are with all this stuff, but if you've used Vim, you're probably using this first command a ton, which basically edits to try to find the file you're looking for based off your current working directory. However, as you become more of an advanced to intermediate user, you'll find yourself using this much less. Why? Because Vim actually does support file indexing using its own custom path. And you'll find that this find command specifically will become absolutely essential to your use cases. We also have more obscure commands like gf to go to file under text or control caret to switch buffers. Again, you'll slowly find yourself using these last three a lot more than the first. Then we have searching. Most of you guys are familiar with searching. You click slash, you hit a pattern, and then you enter. You, you can also do the opposite reverse direction using the question mark. There's also a super cool feature called star or hashtag, which basically searches forward for the text under your cursor, or backwards if you use hashtag. And again, useful mnemonics here. GD goes to the local definition of whatever keyword you have under your cursor. Now I'll briefly touch upon marks, the bookmarks of Vim. So just like you read a book and you forget where you're reading because you don't use a bookmark, this is how you should utilize Vim's marks capabilities to remember where you last came from if you want to go back to some position you looked at in the past. You can use M and then any lowercase, uppercase character to set a mark. And you can jump directly there using the back tick or the quotation mark. And then um, there's also some special marks you can use. But these we won't touch on right now. Finally, tags. These are the universal indexers of Vim. Actually, Vim supports other methods of jumping to different local declarations. But as a beginner, tags will be what are most useful to you to start off with. In this picture, we have the person in the middle who's colorful. That's because that person uses tags. So they can seamlessly navigate through projects just using control right bracket and control T. The person on the left is tagless. So she hates Vim and thinks all other IDEs are better. And that other person just can't quit out. <laughs> Next, we have the jump list or change list, or what I call artful stroking. So this is super useful. Every single jump you make, and a jump can be anything like editing a new file, using HTML to go to different parts of your screen, or just going, like pressing capital G to jump to the end of the file. They're all saved within Vim. And if you do colon jumps, you can see every jump you've made. And what this means is when you go to another file and you want to go back to wherever you came from, you don't need to edit that file, go through your working directory to find it again. You can just hit control O to go backwards in a jump. Also, <coughs> Vim actually saves every change you make. So if you made a change and you want to go back where you last made your change, 
Again, don't need to do any of that file editing stuff. Just G semicolon or G comma to go back to your last change. So again, huge mouthful. But again, I want to really highlight that the point of this talk is to show you Vim's capabilities, not to memorize all these commands. So that next time, if you're thinking about doing something, you can remember, oh, yeah, wait, you can do that. I'm going to look it up and figure out how to do that. So this time, I'm going to go through an example where your manager has assigned you with the task of fixing a module named ELG Talk, which prints out Yelp brands, as well as stating that Yelp is awesome. The following should be fixed. There's a small to-do in the main batch file. You also want to figure out why Yelp is not being listed as a brand and why Yelp is awesome is not being printed out. Again, you might not know what's going on, but remember, we have to fix some small to-do. We have to figure out why Yelp isn't being listed as a brand and why Yelp is awesome is not being printed out. So I'm going to jump to the next example. So here we have a directory with a bunch of files. We don't really know what the project's about yet, but we know we want to fix whatever is being printed out. So let's run that batch file. As you can see, right now it's printing see you on Yelp. Yelp is Yelp, and these are the Yelp brands. You can see it's not printing Yelp is awesome, but Yelp is Yelp. And also, we want Yelp to be listed as one of those brands. So this time, again, I'm going to load Vim with no custom configurations whatsoever. Next thing I'm going to do is just turn on some better syntax highlighting to make it easier for you guys to see. <clears throat> now, I'm also, just to assist with you guys interacting <coughs> with me, I'm going to show you all the commands I use on the right. So first thing, we can see in the middle that there's a small to-do that we want to fix. Now, intuitively, you could say, oh, I'll just jump relative. <coughs> Sorry, my <coughs> Intuitively, you could say that you could just jump relative to your current line 23 lines downwards. But what's an easy, even easier way? Where on the screen is it? Where on the screen is the to-do? Middle. So guess why I can press M. I'm in the middle. Done. This time I got lucky, but at least you're close <laughs> enough to it, right? <clears throat> Next thing, it says fix spelling. So apparently this person couldn't spell Yelp. So what we can do is we can use that word-wise navigation to jump there, right? One capital W, another capital W. And then we can use something like the Vim grammar to say, I want to change inside these quotation marks. Change inside quotation marks and fix Yelp. But actually, that wasn't even that efficient, actually. You can do better than that. What about, because um, these words weren't unique, right? The, the actual bracket next to Yelp represents a word itself, which makes it kind of annoying. So what's unique within that Yelp word that we can utilize? What about the character Y or the character P? You can just say find P, delete the character, and paste it. That's it. Done. Now, the next thing we might want to do is, also, it's saying Yelp is false. We don't really know what this means, but we'll hopefully figure it out later. Next thing we want to do, right? We want to figure out where this main function is called. At least that's what I would do. So there's a couple options here. You could just scroll down to look using Control-E. You can scroll back up using Control-Y. This is showing you the scrolling functionality. Another thing you might do is you might just hit G to go to the end of the file. Alternatively, you could just scroll down with up and down. And if you want to move the screen in a way that your cursor's in the middle, remember that command, ZZ. Or if you don't want to, just go back with ZB. OK, cool. Next we're seeing it's calling this run function somehow. So let's go to it. What many people might do is they might use the search command to find it, and then navigate using N or capital N. And I'm just going to turn off the highlight searching, because it's kind of annoying for me. Oh, thank you. So another thing you can do is, if you look on the right, if I put it there, I didn't put it there. But you can do something like GD to go to definition. And this is a local definition. So if I hit GD, it'll go right to where that run function is. Now we see this load configuration method is being called upon. So maybe we want to look at that a bit more. And how do we get there? Again, you can just use relative line number jumping to get there. In this case, that wasn't that efficient. What most of you might think about doing later, though, as you get more fluent with them, is I would like to do something like this. I go to the end of the method, and in that case, it didn't work. Oh, it worked. And then just go back twice. 
Now this is the part where people think, I hate Vim because how, how do I get to that function, right? Like I could scroll up and I could see that it's called by some configuration module, but where, where the hell is that, right? Well, that's where tags come in. If you see what my printing working directory is, it's exactly in my main number two module. Now I can do something and create an index based off my current working directory. In this case, I'm using C tags as my universal indexer. And I'm making sure that it only tags Python language based files. And I'm also excluding the virtual env run uh, module here. So now, guess what I can do? I can go to the definition of the load config by do so, doing something like g control right bracket. And it tells me all the different places it sees the keyword load config. If I didn't include the, the G, it would jump to the first one it sees, which in this case is the import at the top. That's why I use G in the beginning this time. So I can just jump there using two, because that's the second one is the one that actually has the method definition. So now I'm here. And now I see, OK, this load configuration function is loading some YAML file based off the config path. Cool. And now you want to say, OK, how do I get back now? I, I want to get back because I want to figure out what it's doing. Should I like control E and then go all the way there? And I'm already, I'm pissed off now. Remember that other thing, the jumping? Guess what control O does? It jumps to where you were. You're there again. Now we want to look at that default config path. We could search for it manually, or we could utilize something like the hashtag to immediately jump to it. And if we go to the word itself with the path, guess how we can go to that file? Any, anyone know how we can go to that file? You can hit G F to go to file. And you're there. And now we see, oh, this is why Yelp isn't being printed as a brand. So let me add that. And that's easy. Just add Yelp right here. And save it. And again, how do we jump back? Yes, control O, nice. And in this case, I had to do it twice because I did one jump to go to the end of the file that time. Now, what do we want to do? We can jump back one more time and we see it's calling discover Yelps. In this case, you don't really need to jump back to the method itself because you can see it's right there above run. And that's initializing some ELG talk object and also calling the discover Yelps method, whatever that does. So why don't we go there? We can go to the end of the next method and just hit BB to go to that method. And we can, again, utilize our tags for this. Let's just go there. G, control right bracket to list all of the tags. And then we can see the second one is where the class is being called. So let's go there. And here we can see why it's printing Yelp is Yelp instead of Yelp is awesome. It's because we're loading some object factory which should contain Yelp, but either doesn't or the value of whatever is in that dictionary is false. So we need to make that dictionary value true. Again, how can we get back? Control O, easy. So you can see on line seven, we want to make that value false. And luckily, we can jump directly there using our change list. In this case, for some reason, it went to the line below it. I'm not too sure why. But this should be an easy fix, right? Change the word to true. And we should be done. Now, assuming I saved all the files, which I think I did, we can check if this worked. And I didn't really prepare for this that well, but Vim actually supports its own native terminal buffer. So we don't even need to use Tmux for this, actually. I'm going to set my shell to Z shell, because I like that. And then I'm going to create a terminal buffer at the top. And here, I'm just going to paste the actual command I want to run. And now you can see it's printing Yelp is awesome, and these are the Yelp brands. And this is all just within Vim, by the way. This, this terminal buffer thing is just insane. It's crazy. Um, so we're not even going to stop there. I'm going to keep going. It's going to keep getting better. So the next thing I want to talk about is project management in Vim, because this is the essential feature that most people can't utilize when using Vim as an IDE. How do you manage all these different projects, or at least the submodules within your project? And I'm going to title this, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Vim Buffers. And the reason for that is because when you first start Vim as a beginner, one thing you'll realize is 
you're going to make tabs for everything. And I don't know why I made this mistake too, but you should be developing a buffer-centric workflow when really utilizing Vim. And that's because the traditional concept of tabs is completely different from Vim's concept of tabs. So why is this? Here's three key sentences I want you to remember. Tabs are window containers. Windows are buffer viewports. And buffers are file proxies. Buffers are what you think of the traditional sense of tabs. We're also going to talk briefly about the arg list, because that's an obscure feature that everyone should really know, I think. And we're just going to talk about these all one by one, going from the bottom up. So why are we going from the bottom up? Because each is comprised of the features below it. So let's first start with buffers. These are file proxies. On the left, you have four different files delineated by different colors. Buffers are on a one-to-one -one mapping with file proxies. And again, you have many sample actions for moving around, like bn for next buffer, b for go to buffer by its name, and bd delete current buffer. Now, here's another super useful tip I want you guys to remember. There's a difference between buffers and arguments. Buffers represent every single file you've traversed within your Vim session, which means it's more akin to the history when navigating a browser. Arguments, on the other hand, represent exactly the files you open when you first start Vim. So for example, if you do Vim A and B, your arg list will have A and B, whereas you can navigate for like 10, 20 minutes and browse 20 different files now your buffer list will have like 22 different files, but your arg list will only have two, the first two you loaded. And you can only add to this argument list by explicitly doing so. So the argument list is a stable subset of the buffer list, which makes it extremely useful when you want to separate functionalities of different modules. And again, we're going to show you an example later. But one way you know that you should be using the arg list is how come it's harder to go to the next buffer than it is to go to the next file based on the arg list? That's because before buffers were even a thing, the argument list was there first. Buffers were only added in like Vim version 7.4 or something. Okay, next we're going to talk about windows. Again, windows are not a one-to-one -one mapping with files. Only buffers are. Windows are only a means of tailoring your eyes to look at your buffers in a visually appealing manner. So not many actions to talk about here. Just remember, you can split it with S or vertically split it with V. Another useful command I want to highlight with that lightning bolt, San Francisco. Just remember San Francisco. This will split your window and use your path to find that file to open the split. It's super useful. And finally, tabs. Again, never, ever, if, if there's one tip I want to highlight from this talk is when you start using Vim, do not create a, a tab for every file you make. That's not what tabs were designed for. They're designed to separate window collections so that if you have some specific window collection and you want to make sure you can get back to it, you can just open a new tab and get back to it using GT or G capital T. So remember, tabs are not the traditional sense of tabs. They're window containers. So here's just an example of how you might utilize everything. On the right, we have two modules, module one and module two. And maybe for personal preference, I want to use tab one mostly for module one stuff. But I still want to look at a file in module two to compare it with my x.py, because like, maybe they have the same code and I want to look at it. In this case, you can just open a window split and open that file within your window within your tab. And on the right, we have a tab that we might utilize mostly for module two stuff. So now we're going to talk about the last example. And I'm going to show you how to use Vim as an IDE. In this case, your manager has assigned you with the task of fix, fisking, fixing a module named three, which needs some brushing up. Specifically, your manager has asked the following. You want to fix this config.yaml file in module C, and you want to replace all to-dos with done. So how can you do that? So remember, we're going to fix this config.yaml file, and we want to replace the to-dos with done. So let's go there. And this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to load the actual file, not using, um, oh, sorry, I should show you the actual working directory first. 
So here we have three modules or submodules A, B, and C, and we have a main.py file. We don't have anything, we don't know what's going on, so we want to browse the project. So what I can do is I can open main.py, and this time I'm not providing none because I'm going to show you how you can use your own custom vimrc as well. So I'm just going to digress real quickly and go there. Here I have no external plugin set except for a color scheme. But you can see it's really basic, and I've set a file mark using capital V, so I can jump there using my bookmarks really quickly. And file marks are saved to disk, so it's super useful. Now I'm going to jump back with control caret. So here we see a bunch of to-dos, and it's saying you should learn windows, tabs, and buffers. So one problem a lot of people say is, okay, I don't like Vim because I can't see like a project tree of everything I'm working on. For example, I want to get a good sense of what this project's about, but I can't see everything in a, in a nice working directory tree. Well, it turns out you can, and it's a built-in internal plugin to Vim. Here, I'm stating to create a 20 character wise visual split on my current working directory. And then you can see everything, just to your left. This is awesome because now you can actually see all the files within your working directory tree. Now let's say I don't want to use this though. Now I want to somehow like maybe go to the tabs.py file. Well, remember that find command? Instead of editing, and again, this will take forever. I, I got to the wrong directory. It's like such a pain. I'm in the wrong file. Screw that. Just use find. Find tabs. It found it. We're there. Nice. Now let's say I want to see that config file. Well, guess what? I can make a vertical split and hit San Francisco to mean I want to split my find. And I'm just going to call config.yaml, and it'll auto-complete just for you with all the options right there. Again, super useful. And let's say I want to change the viewport, just control WX. Nice. Now let's say I want to look more into module B, but I want to save this window collection. Guess what this is a great use case for? Tabs. So you can actually use tab finding as well. So in this case, I'm going to do tab find of Let's say I want to look at that config file first. Oops, I didn't hit find, that's why. So now I can jump there in its own tab. And let's say again, I want to split this vertically with whatever file was here. I think it was buffers. And we're here. Again, we're exploring our project directory in a really discernible fashion that allows us to go back and jump back and forth. So now let's go to the final one. Now we want to look at the windows.py file. We can actually do this directly by jumping to the window and browsing through our uh, explorer tree. Also, there's this stuff directory. What if we want to preview this really quickly? We can just hit P to preview and control W to Z to close the preview window. And note that all these to-dos seem to be in the Python files only. And remember what our task was. We want to fix the config.yaml file in module C and replace all to-dos with done. So we've kind of looked through our project directory, kind of know what's going on, everything. Um, let's open that config.yaml file. And let's make it the only window using control W O. So the problem here is we don't really know what to change, right? But we do have some reference points. There's two other config files somewhere. So why don't we compare them together somehow? But how do you do that? Most of you might think, OK, I'll manually edit each of them and then maybe do a vertical split one by one, but that takes a lot of effort. And how do I navigate all of there to all those files like really quickly? Well, one thing you might note is we could use buffers. We can navigate all previously traversed files using the buffers. But the problem with this is the buffer list is really long. So using stuff like BN or BP isn't that efficient. And this is where you should understand what the arguments are used for. What I can do here is I can specify to make my argument list, and I'll show you what the arg list says first. It's only the main.py file, and that's because that's what we opened using Vim to start off with. So I can actually specify to have my argument list be all those YAML files to compare. And it'll jump to the first one. So now we can look at our argument list, and it contains all of those different config files in their separate modules. But this isn't that useful, because we want to see all of it split together some way. At least we have it in our argument list, though. So we have a set of files in a defined manner that we can work with. If, there, if only there was a way to split all of them, like something like split all, 
Well, there it is. Nice. Now, let's say we wanted to vertically split all of them. If only there was a way to say, can I vertically split all of them? Oh, yeah, you can. Nice. Now, maybe you can see what the difference is, but maybe you can't. If only there was a way to say, do for every window a diff on this file. You've done it. Now, you can see that the change to make is that last thing, the adding Yelp as a brand, because that's the only color not on the third window. So what we can do now is just manually add that, right? So just add brand. And guess what? Vim supports its own custom file completion. So I don't even need to do anything. I can just do this. Done. Now, let's say you want to navigate back to your tabs. You can do stuff like GT or GT again. We're only working with two tabs right now. Now, what was that other task? It was to replace all the to-dos with done. If you've been following along, you've noticed that all these to-dos are in the Python files only. So how can we replace all the to-dos in the Python file only? Let's say I wanted to go back to the main function. I can just use find for that. And I'll make this the only window. I could manually go through each Python file and do a search and replace on the to-do. But this isn't that efficient. If only there was a way to use something like grep or ack. Well, guess what vim stands for? It stands for vim grep. And you can literally grep for the name to do. In this case, it says file name is missing or invalid pattern. And that's because you also have to specify the file that you want to do the vim grepping on. In this case, we can use the percent sign to represent the current file. Now, on the bottom, you can see one out of four different to-dos to look at. And we can navigate this using the quick fix list, which is an obscure concept that you don't need to know about, but at least you know there's this functionality here. And we can repeat our command using this. And it navigates through each to-do. But again, this isn't very useful because that's just this current file, right? What if we wanted to do it on all our Python files? Well, guess what? That's what we can use the args command for, right? If we do args on all Python files from our working directory, and then look at our args, we can see now it's all the Python files. So what can we do now? Why don't we do vim grep on all of our argument list? If we do vim, again, to do, in this case, instead of the current file, I can do double hashtag to represent everything in my argument list. Now it says one out of 10. Let's go through those matches. Now, if we do that, we'll see it matches every to do in our argument list. OK, cool, but now we want to replace it. Is there a way to replace every to-do in our quick fix list? Again, if, if there's something you're thinking about, Vim probably can do it for you. There's actually a do for every change function, cdo, and replace to-do with done, and do that for every occurrence on every line. And you can see, if we navigate back, it's all done. So you can pretty much do a lot of this stuff with Vim. Although I would say ACK is definitely much faster if you're working with a super large project. But for most lightweight cases, it's totally practical. So I guess we still have some time. So now I'm going to talk quickly about clipboard synchronization. If there's one thing that like, it completely infuriates me, it's when my clipboard isn't synchronized between remote and local machines. And maybe that's because I have OCD or something, but it's really frustrating. And I feel like this is like the most useful thing or tool any programmer should know. So there's a few ways you can do this. You could do something like reverse SSH tunneling, where you open a reverse tunnel from your uh, remote machine to your local one, such that you're basically piping it back to your local machine and doing a PB copy. But that's really hacky. And also, as of like a week or two ago, they disabled this functionality and set remote login off on your local machines. So you can't really do this unless you do some like constant Tron job or cron job, which turns on remote login all the time. So that's not that useful anymore, and it's kind of hacky. I loved this for the longest time. What is this? This is X11 forwarding. Basically, you can use the X window server to synchronize your local and remote machine. But again, 
this is also super hacky. And unfortunately, a week ago, I was going to talk about it, but a week ago, they disabled this for security reasons. And that makes sense because if your server is compromised, it can kind of like technically allow you to gain access back to your local machine. Um, so yeah, I used this for the longest time, but it's super hacky and they disabled it. I was going to file a ticket though. So I went to ops and I asked, can we get X11 server forwarding like on again? And then um, I think Timothy Jew told me, why don't you just use OSC 52? And this was, this was crazy. I'm sure most of you haven't heard of this. This is the most crazy thing I've ever seen. And like, if you look it up, there's, it's, it's, it's really like not well known. There's very few forums talking about it. But basically, depending on your terminal, I think it was originally supported by Xterm, your terminal recognizes a certain escape sequence called the operating sequence, which will send a signal to that parent terminal TTY, which will do something to your terminal. And in this case, OSC 52 allows synchronization or working with your terminal emulator's clipboard, which is insane. So if you send this sequence to your terminal, it can copy it directly. It's absolutely mind-blowing. So I can actually show you this really quickly. And the, the, th the awesome thing about this is it's so simple. As long as your terminal supports like base64 encoding, um, you're fine. And this particular escape sequence, of course, which most terminals do. Like if you use iTerm2, you're fine. As long as you allow application access to your clipboard, it'll work. It'll just work. It's crazy. So I'm going to show you this. If you look back to my vimrc, you can see there's this commented out part. So right now, right, it's really annoying because if I yank this, I can't, I can't paste it, right? It's pasting something I yanked from before or from my clipboard. But watch this. This function is insane. And it doesn't even require a plugin. This is all no plugins except for a color scheme. So what this is doing is it's basically calling a system command for base64 encoding at zero, which is your yanked register. And it's really cool because Vim also supports a bunch of registers, which you can look at for pasting anywhere. I didn't have time to talk about this, but you should remember this too. But anyway, it, it, it base64 encodes your yanked register. And then it appends this character sequence called the OSC SSC 52 escape sequence to that buffer. And then finally, I'm going to silently echo it to my TTY. And in this case, each time I start terminal, I make sure to include the, the, the slave TTY to um, output to. So now watch this. If I source, oh, oops, and I also have to uncomment this method. So if I source my vimrc file, and then let's say I wanted to copy this, and then I'll call that function using my escape y. Guess what happens? It's copied to your local clipboard. This is a command V I'm using right here. And if this is, just seems like stupid, useless stuff, well, fine. But this is actually like completely mind-blowing to me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's clipboard synchronization. Next, I'm going to talk about hotkeys. And this. I usually don't, for this talk, I didn't want to recommend like any customized plugins or anything. But one thing I want to mention is there's this super cool Chrome plugin called Surfing Keys. This is the only recommendation I'll do because I don't want to be that guy. But if I had to recommend something, it's Surfing Keys. So what does this allow you to do? It allows you to make your browser a Vim editor itself. So you can navigate everywhere just using your Vim browser. So if I go back to this browser, oh, oh, I'm in the browser right now. So what I can do is, I'll exit out of the screen, actually. So I can set marks for everything I want to do. So let's say, for example, I want to do a new tab. Apple T works for that, right? But let's say I want to go to Jira. Oh, it didn't work for this. Oh, right, because I did capital J. OK, now we're doing technical difficulties. <laughs> but anyway, you can navigate using anything, JJ, KK, to go back. And let's say I want to go to Jira. I can just I set a mark for it. So I just do um, quotation mark J to go there. Let's say I want to check my mail. I can go there using mark M. And let's say I want to go back to Jira, and I want to export some tickets or something, right? I can use all of Vim's building commands for this. I can change the focus, too, using CS. And then I can like go to that file, hit ZG. It, it just, just all works like that. It's crazy. I want to go to my thing. I'm there. Let's say I want to copy something, right? I want to copy this, this name right here. 
I can use Vim to copy it. It's copied. That's crazy, right? So I just wanted to mention that really briefly because it really it makes editing so fun and browsing so fun too. So final thing I want to talk about is screen multiplexing. So this one you're all probably quite familiar with. Oops, I didn't do presenter mode. This one you're all pretty familiar with, right? Um, and yes, I used my mouse just now. I screwed up. I shouldn't have. But um, screen multiplexing you're all pretty familiar with. This allows you to actually multiplex your projects into different window panes. So instead of having a Vim session, you can have multiple Vim sessions within one window. And in this case, the screen-wise window is different from a Vim window. This allows you to, say, have a terminal uh, pane on the bottom and like two other panes for doing other stuff, like doing Vim or writing a service, whatever. The nice thing about Tmux is it's signal hiccup resistant. So if you're SSH somewhere and the server dies or the server connection dies, you can be sure that if you just go back and reattach, everything will still be there. Less interesting is window splitting. And why is it less interesting to me? Because Vim already does all of this. And um, I'm going to talk about later, if I have time, how we can actually completely replace the use of Tmux because that's what I'm trying to work on right now. I think it's a bit beefy for my liking, but it is super useful. And right now, there's nothing more convenient to it. So can you do everything in Vim? Like the limitation here for Vim, right, is you can't multiplex different screens. But actually, you can, because now Vim 8 and NeoVim support terminal buffers. So if you actually do tab-wise project navigation, the only thing you don't have is session management. So one of the most recent revolutions I've discovered is I can make everything much more lightweight by not using Tmux itself, but by using or subscribing more to the Unix philosophy and having another lightweight tool just for session management and another lightweight tool just for Windows management. Tmux does too much and is, can, can be kind of slow, even if it's like a few milliseconds. So what I've recently done, and I just did this last night so I don't have any slides prepared, I'm starting to use something called Abduku for session management, which only does that, reattachment and deattachment to an application. And then I'm using something like VTM for the actual window management as a very lightweight alternative. And by doing so, you can just reattach to Vim sessions and just do everything there using NeoVim or Vim 8. But again, this is like way more complicated than other stuff in the talk, and maybe I'll do another ELG for this specifically. But that's it, thanks. Questions? Oh, yeah. Nope. Yeah. All right. Uh, Here. One second. We'll... Do I use plugins? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Do you use plugins for your Vim? Oh, yeah. I use like, I, I use a ton. I used to use like, so I think like the typical workflow you'll follow when learning Vim is when I first started, I didn't know like any of the stuff I talked about. So I was like making a new tab for every file and I didn't know how to like jump to method declaration or whatever. So I just installed a crap ton of plugins. Like I installed like 20. But I realized as I progressed and learned more and more, a lot of these plugins I didn't really need because they're supported by Vim's core functionality. But right now I use like a few and on my personal space you can check that out. So yeah. As someone who just like really never uses Vim yeah. unless I have to, yeah. what's the best way to, to there's so many commands. Yeah, They're yeah. They're so yeah. hard to keep track of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you how do you get into that? Yeah, I agree. So um, first start off with just the grammar, the first like theme I talked about. Forget about everything else and literally just focus on creating buffers and speaking the language. So every file you open, just create a new buffer for it. Forget about windows, forget about tabs, forget about everything else I talked about. Just focus on buffers and also using the Vim grammar. So like if you want to change a word, don't like HTML, change a word. Like everything you think about, think about if there's a mnemonic to do that. If you want to delete a paragraph, D-A-P, right? Just focus on that. And then after you master that, then you can slowly like go up a notch. And the way I do this is you can just like write notes each time you like do something and 
just remember to do that next time you have that question. Like, don't try to learn everything at once, but when there's a useful feature you wish Vim had, look it up and then remember it and just keep repeating that process. And also, I should have showed you guys actually, one thing you'll utilize a lot is Vim's built-in help, which is incredibly useful. The only problem with this is sometimes you don't know how to like, specify what you want help with. But for example, if you want to help with navigation, and sorry, the, the thing wasn't there anymore. I'm just going to move this. So if you want help with navigation, just colon H navigation, and then you can see everything for this. It tells you everything. It's all built into Vim. And you can like, read this as you go along. Just take like, a few things out of it. Don't read all of it at once. But anytime you want help with something, Vim has a great built-in like, help support. Um, and that's why like, throughout these slides on the top left, I've specified like, get help by typing that into Vim. But yeah, it, it's definitely a harsh learning curve. I'd say like insurmountable, but that's part of the fun. <laughs> like you're, you're constantly learning something, right? Um, when you were show, uh, showing the uh, project navigator, yeah. uh, can you edit the files so uh, it will reflect what file are you in in the project navigator? So when you open the file, it will show you the full, full path to that file. You mean like in the navigator, when I open yeah. it, it opens here? Uh, no, when you were like jumping between files, can it be reflected in the project navigator on the left? Like more oh, or less how okay. IDEs yeah, yeah. do it. In this case, uh, the built-in Vim doesn't support that. I know exactly what you're talking about, though. There's a, a plugin called um, Nerdtree. This is a pretty popular one that does exactly what you're saying. So okay, yeah, I think Vim's built-in um, project navigator is kind of iffy right now. There's a lot of improvements that can be made, um, but that plugin I mentioned it does exactly what you want. Yeah. All right, that's all the time we have for okay, questions. Cool. So another round of applause for Lear and <laughs> have a great weekend, everyone. And if you're interested in speaking about your own set of tools that you like to use. Um, we're pretty booked up for the next couple months, but May 25th is available if anybody wants to speak on that date.